Well, that was a kick in the gut. This is Free Association on the Sportsnet Podcast Network. I'm J.D. Bunkus. He's Donovan Bennett. We used to do these rapid react shows. We did them for, did we do them for one or two years on the YouTube stream live? Do you remember? I think we only did it for the one, one year. year, right? So we do it for the one year and they play that game against the Cleveland Cavaliers where game one, Jonas Valanciunas can't tip a ball in. They go to overtime and they lose to LeBron James. And you and I walk in the studio and I remember looking at you and just I think I told you that I didn't know what I was going to say and that I just felt empty. And I haven't felt like that in a long time. I haven't felt like that in a long time because the Toronto Raptors had Kawhi Leonard. The Toronto Raptors went into a bubble. They didn't lose a basketball game. They had one of their most incredible seasons, maybe arguably outside of winning a championship regular season wise, their most exciting ever. And they lose game one of the Celtics in a really just blowout fashion. But I feel that way again after game two, I'm, I, I, I kind of know where to begin. I kind of know the frustrations that I want to talk about, but I, I'm at a loss for words. Just like, how are you feeling right now? I feel good. Not a good meal. <laughs> yeah, good night's sleep. Last You're a very level great. man. Yeah. I mean, I, I would challenge the fact that you haven't felt like that since. I think you felt like that uh, after the first two games against Milwaukee a year ago. I think you felt like that when Joel Embiid was, was flying all over the court and the Raptors um, got bodied. So, I mean, listen, the lack of a Kawhi Leonard is a real thing and it, it showed itself today. But I, I do remember times in the run um, last year, I mean, to a lesser extent, but even in the finals, like Dalla hits a big three and you're like, oh, the Warriors are being the Warriors. Lowry gets blocked in the corner and you're like, oh my goodness. Did, is Kyle going to be clutch or not? I, I, there is, on the road to a championship, there are these crazy periods where you're stuck in the mud. And in the 48 hours, or now you know more than that, uh, people are going to overreact to the end of the road. And people are going to start re writing off-season columns. And then like, you get out of it. Like, talk to a Utah Jazz fan right now. Yeah. And full disclosure, we are taping this um, as the Utah Jazz are tipping off against – the Denver Nuggets. So if the Jazz win, the Utah Jazz fans are going to be pretty excited. But the point is, um, a week ago, about a week ago, the Jazz fans were flying. And that's not the case now. And, and Nuggets fans were like, we've got to blow up our team. So um, there were some ugly parts, but there was some good stuff as well. Um, I guess I'm just not ready to overreact. But if they lose the next game and they're down 3-0, then there will be nothing to overreact to because it really would be a wrap at that point. Yeah, I, I think it's not that I felt bad about the Raptors' chances or a lack of optimism about their chances. I think it's more the feeling of just you let one get away that you absolutely should have had. So you know what? If there was a game that I would compare this to, it would probably be the feeling of game one against Milwaukee. You're right, where the Raptors seemed like they were going to be in control, they were going to win this game, and then they end up blowing it. And that's just the way I feel about this, this ball game. Like the Raptors in the third quarter before I think the, the last two or three minutes, they looked like they were about to go into, I don't want to say cruise control, but that they had this game. If they just play well and continue to do the things that they've been doing all game long, which was Pascal Siakam playing with a good pace, which was getting solid contributions from OG Ananobi, which was playing really solid defense, which was moving the basketball, which was making good hustle plays. And I think we just have to start with Marcus Smart because that completely shifted the game. Marcus Smart comes out in the fourth quarter and bombs five three-pointers, including one that's an N1-3. He probably could have had even another one that was an N1-3. Like I, I thought maybe there was call for contact. He's going up and down the floor. I, I, I've thought this always about the Celtics, that Tatum is their best player. Kemba is a leader. But Marcus Smart is just this emotional guy that can get them going like I don't think another player on that roster. And he catches fire. He gets red hot. The Raptors get caught with their pants down a little bit. And all of a sudden, their offense starts to get clunky. All of a sudden, they can't buy a basket. All of a sudden, the ball starts sticking. And they start to do things that I think are kind of bad habits. And you kind of blink your eyes and there's a 9-0 run. And, and they're down. And they're kind of trying to scrap and claw back with some open shots. And they just couldn't make it. And, and the point I made on Twitter and the one that we discussed going into this thing became very, very evident down the stretch, which is 
one of these teams has elite shot making and the other team just simply does not. And I think there's going to be a lot of piling on Pascal Siakam over the next 48 hours. He had a dreadful game one and his game two started correctly, but he tries to go ISO on Marcus Smart to finish the game. I guess that's what they drew up for him. I don't know why the hell they're still doing that. Like to me, you can't put Siakam against Marcus Smart and think that that's a good matchup for you. And then secondarily, he steps out of bounds with the game basically on the line. It's a bit of a scramble, but dear Lord, man, like I, he's going to get killed for this ball game. But I think it's a little bit unfair because again, he's just not that guy. He's not Kemba Walker. He's not Jason Tatum. If you're going head to head in a tight ball game and it's Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam needing to make shots for you and Kyle Lowry versus Kemba Walker and Jason Tatum, you're going to come up short. And with Marcus Smart playing the way that he did in that fourth quarter, like the results seem predictable for me, even when the Raptors closed the gap to one and there was that crazy push off. It's just, this is, this is the difference between these two teams. And, and it was very, very evident down the stretch. Yeah. So there's a lot there. I mean, on Marcus Smart, he like does Lowry isms. Like he makes yeah. a lot of Kyle Lowry ish plays and he's someone that you hate playing against and really I, I hate watching against him if that was a phrase like I hate mm -hmm. when my team is playing his team and watching him play uh his um clear pa path flop which is a new one I don't know if I've seen that before um was super annoying to watch but after his clear path flop he bangs five straight threes uh has a couple clutch hustle plays including uh, a block on Siakam uh and he was the emotional throughout the game he, he I don't want to go as far as to say he took the Raptors heart because they were still competing but he took the game and um you know I love watching inside the NBA after a, a night of fun basketball and, and one thing they often say is x player did not let his team lose tonight so there's been Jamal Murray Luca um you know Chris Paul uh forcing a game seven Marcus Smart did not let his team lose tonight. And, and so uh, Pascal struggled. I, 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 Smart is a bit of a mirage where you have a switch and it's like, oh, the shooting guard is on me and the two crazy long wing defenders, Brown and Tatum, aren't. I should attack this matchup. Well, no, it's like a mirage because Marcus Smart's arms are just as long as theirs are, and he's stronger and he's got great instincts. So you maybe you shouldn't attack him. I don't think he's going to get killed for – stepping out of bounds when he was trying to gather to shoot a three like that we see that play happen in every game so it's unfortunate it sucks everyone saw it happening before it happened but um you know such is life when you have size 15 feet but I, aside from that and when you when you made the ma sound i thought you were going to say ma gasol yeah. because gasol fouls out he is still allergic to looking for his offense. He had a couple difficult calls against them where I felt like he was in position and, you know, Tatum just ran in his chest and threw the ball up and went to the line. By the way, I, before I, I finish on Gasol, the Raptors, take a wild guess how many free throws they had in the first half of the basketball game. Oh, I know. They had zero. But okay. I actually thought it kind of worked out in their favor with the way the whistle went in the second half. Like I, I Well, somehow they got to the bonus. Yeah. But but still, in a playoff basketball game against a very aggressive team, to have zero free throws and to be only down two is like a small victory in itself. Part of the reason is I thought it was an inconsistent whistle. The other part of the reason is because evidently they're trying to be the Houston Rockets for some reason and, and jack up all types of threes when, when nothing else seems to present itself offensively. But, but speaking of like forcing a whistle – Jason Tatum got to the line 14 times. He hit 14 free throws. Like at some point, I, I know that the fundamentals offensively, Jason Tatum is just a much more complete offensive player, but he also is relentless in terms of forcing the issue. He had 14 free throws and it was like kind of a quiet night, which is like unfathomable. And I think for me, that's the biggest thing um, in terms of a learning curve for Pascal is understanding, okay, when you have the matchup and you need to be aggressive and, and force the issue and like when you don't and you need to keep the ball moving and, and, and cut and, and 
find someone else, quite frankly, who has the matchup. Because if Marcus Smart is guarding you, that means he's not guarding Kyle Lowry. That means he's not guarding Fred Van Vliet. Um, and thus, I think that would become the matchup. I just, I find it really difficult to judge Siakam. And I said this on the radio the other day because he gets criticized for being too passive and then he also gets criticized for being too aggressive at times. And what I liked about his game early is that he has these moments where he can find that right pocket that makes you believe where he sees Jalen Brown come out to the perimeter and he says, I'm really fast. I'm going to take this ball to the basket. I'm going to force the issue. He plays with a little bit of confidence. He shoots that little turnaround shot and he knocks that down and it looks good. He's playing great defense. He had, he had a pivotal moment in that fourth quarter where you look like, okay, this was actually going to be a breakthrough for him after he makes a beautiful steal on smart, gets it down the floor, gets a touch, kicks it back out to Fred Van Vliet, sets him up for a three. I think the, that put the Raptors down three at that point. You thought, okay, good, good Pascal, because this, this was big. This was a big moment for you. This is now kind of the turning point, getting stops and getting out in transition. He's just not there yet. And I just, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know if he'll ever get there. I think it's a really, really difficult thing to accomplish. We've said that over and over. It's, it's one of those cliches, right? When we talk about Siakam is everybody that talks about him goes, well, the hardest thing to do is to get to be a top scorer in the NBA. And everyone references how long he's been playing basketball for and this being his first go at, at this playoffs. But this is the thing is that you got to kind of pick a lane. If you're someone who's saying that Pascal Siakam is as good as Jason Tatum, or if you're someone that's saying that, you know, he is a 1A guy or he can be that 1A guy, it's like they kind of needed him to be now because they, if we're talking about championship aspirations, he did sort of have to make that leap. And, and the thing is, is that I don't even think that he needed to be Jason Tatum tonight because you're right, Tatum was brilliant. And I'm never going to expect him to be the, you know, number three overall pick in a draft, a number one scorer from Duke, a guy who has been modeling his game around Kobe Bryant since he was a child. I don't think that he's ever going to be that 1A score, but you got to be reliable in crunch time to make good decisions. And I've said this time and time again with Siakam. He is still at the point in his development. He is still at the point with his offensive arsenal that he's either overthinking it or he's moving too quickly to know what the progress is going to be, what exactly he's going to do. When he plays decisive basketball, when he says, I'm going to the basket and I'm going to finish here against this step slower defender and he identifies the mismatch, he looks brilliant when he's playing against a great a defender, like a Marcus smart. And you put him in a spot where the shot clock's running down and he's got to be able to go to his go-to move. He doesn't have that yet. Like what Pascal Siakam's go-to move is still going to the basket quickly and laying it up with his right hand. It's like, that's not really a move. That's not really a go-to. He doesn't really have a step back or another secondary thing that he can rely on that you feel confident about. There's just nothing in the arsenal yet. That's refined enough to be a closing score. And, and again, I think that you saw that tonight and I'm sorry, but I do look at the foot on the line thing as a bit of a part of it. Yes. You do see that from time to time with players. Yes. He's got size 15, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You're a number one score. You got to have situational awareness. And that's kind of part and parcel with what I'm talking about with attacking Marcus smart in that spot and not looking for a kick out, but trying to finish at the basket or stopping and doing a little pull up or, or anything along those lines. It's, it's situational awareness and it, it cost him late in this ball game. I don't want to spend the whole time on him because I, I don't think that it's fair to put the entire clothes on him. Again, the Raptors did a lot of good things, but you mentioned Marcus Saul and I, and I want to hit on that because I, when we had Vivek Jacob co-hosting for you a couple of weeks ago, he and I were raving about Marcus Saul and I was talking about how Marcus Saul to me is almost like the basketball idiot test where if you look at Marcus Saul and you think he sucks, then you're watching basketball incorrectly because Gasol was one of their most important players in that ball game. He was incredible in that game. Like we can say what we want about the hesitancy. There is time and time again, where when Gasol does touch the ball and it happened in this game with a, a wide open Fred Van Vliet three in the corner where actually I think Fred swung it to someone else and someone else hit it. Um, but either way, where he catches the ball, he sees a double team, he identifies it right away, he knows where the open passer and lane is, he hits it to him and it results in an open shot. He sets incredible screens, he plays incredible defense. Like, there's a reason that Kimba Walker really struggled in this game, and it was a lot to do with Marc Gasol and the way that he hedges on pick and roll actions and the way that he basically just takes away the rim and forced him to take long shots. And if there's like multiple turning points in this game, one of them being Marcus Smart getting hot from three there at the end. One of them being Pascal Siakam not finishing. One of them being Fred Van Vliet missing a couple wide open threes where his feet were set. 
I thought that the Marcus Saul foul will be the one thing that does not get enough attention. That's a bad foul by Marcus Saul. He's got six fouls and he's swinging down at an opponent when he's falling backwards. Like that's going to result in a foul call nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10. And he had to have better situational awareness because he was so important to the Raptors. Like the offense was looking way better with Gasol in this game. Like if you look at the best quarter, the third, it involved Marcus Saul a lot. His minutes were the best minutes that the team had. And bad foul for him, but I just didn't think that the Raptors could recover losing him. Serge Ibaka gives you a lot more with shot making. He's not afraid. That makes up for a lot of what you don't have with Marcus Saul. But the drop off to me in that clear uh, or in that game between those two centers, and especially down crunch time, to, was was pretty obvious. And I thought losing Gasol was big. And and I think that's what you were alluding to when I said Ma. Yeah, I mean, I, call me an idiot then, because uh, Marcus Saul does a lot of good things, but he he's also killing you at times. Daniel Tice is killing him on the boards, killing him. He had a, he had a career day in rebounding in in game one. He out rebounded. He had more than than double the amount of rebounds uh, as Gasol had in, in game two. He fouled out, which is obviously uh, problematic. He's not giving you much offensively in, in, in terms of scoring and looking to score um, in, in six they points. They don't ask and him to do that. We, the point is he can't do that. And, and, and you know who's, who's also like not asking him to, to, to do that is the Celtics because they're not really even guarding him, which makes everything more difficult. And specifically, and Wait, I think, you think this all had a bad game. I like, do uh, yeah. outside of the fouls. Really? Yeah, I I do. Yeah. All right. I do. He he was he was he he was he did not have a good game. Like he it, the the center position as we broke down looking at the backcourt, looking at the wings, the center position was supposed to be theoretically for the Raptors to win this series, mm-hmm. one that the Raptors won and won comfortably to well, compensate for the fact that you know Celtics wings are really good and if you play that even that's great and their their guards are pretty good too and, and again if you play that even or or play slightly better that's great now the guards certainly haven't played slightly better but the point is on the leg of the relay race that is centers you were supposed to win and win handedly and th- that hasn't been the case and so Mark Gasol is 50% of that I'm not gonna blame Chris Boucher in the Boucher minutes. And so Abaka gave you some, some offense with 17 points offense badly needed again, because they've struggled in the half court and really all of Abaka's offense comes in the half court. The pick and pop has looked good. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Marcus Sol didn't have a, a, a good game because Robert Williams and, and Daniel Tice should not be playing you even. They shouldn't and be Robert outplaying Williams you. Robert got all his points against Serge Ibaka. That's exactly what happened. The Raptors were caving them in. Then Serge Ibaka came out of the game. And then Robert Williams came in, and he scored 10 points. Like, that's what happened. It's not a thing about, like, what they should be doing. It's like, this is what actually happened in the ball game. And when they played Marc Gasol in that game, when he wasn't in foul trouble, the Raptors were winning handedly through, like, all of those minutes. Whether but, who, but, but, he, but he was in foul trouble for the balance of the game. So you can't say when he wasn't because he was. And the, 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 main, um, the main catalyst for him being in foul trouble is him. Like, I can't, I can't place that blame on somebody else. So, so for me, I, I just, for them to get where they need to go, Marcus wants to play better. Like, I, 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 think, I think that's I'm – it's not just him. Fred Van Vliet has to certainly play better. Um, you, you know, you don't want to be setting records as the first guy in league history to miss nine three-pointers in your first two games in a, in a playoff mm-hmm. series. Um, so, no, it's not just Marc Gasol. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I said earlier that I'm not too worried about Marc Gasol, that basically – you're just going to take him off layaway and you're going to need some really impactful minutes or, or, or maybe a, a very specific series where he really matters. Um, but in this specific matchup, like he has to play and play well. And I don't think he, I don't think he played well. And, and yeah. a lot of guys on the Raptors didn't play well. The second best player tonight. Like yeah. I, I thought that Marcus Gasol after like it went one OG because I thought OG played a near flawless game. The turnover that he had at the end was really tough when it was him and Kyle Lauer in the corner that I think extended Boston's lead to 9-0. But overall, OG was spectacular. I I think that, uh, frankly, I just think that you're missing a lot with Gasol's defense and what he actually is provide, what he's asked to do offensively and what he's providing you in that series. Like, 
there they didn't really ask him to take a lot of open looks and the ones that he had he i thought he was kind of aggressive tonight he did take those shots his defense was obviously spectacular like again he had a huge hand in kemba walker's night um yeah i thought he moved the ball well the raptors like you just look at when the Raptors had success in the third quarter, it's because they were humming the basketball around. And like, that's what Marcus Gasol provides you on offense. And like, I think that we get really bogged down as commentators sometimes at looking at like who's making shots because basketball has become such an isolation heavy game and looking at, you know, who is scoring for you, but it's not just about like who's putting the ball through the basket. It's also about the guy who's setting up all of the plays. And I thought that Marcus Gasol in the third quarter was like a huge catalyst for them. Like if I'm looking at Raptors who struggled in that ball game and like, Again, I don't even like to play the blame game or, or whatever because, again, the Celtics played really great. Tatum played great. Um, Marcus Smart had incredible shot making. But there were moments where the Raptors could have stolen that ball game. I thought there was a couple of things. One is that Kyle Lowry tried to bring a lot of emotional intensity to that game, but he wasn't very effective. I felt like – did you? this is how I felt about Kyle Lowry's game, that it was either moments of brilliance or moments of awful. That, like he didn't have very much in between. Like he's either making a big play, taking a charge – or getting, you know, to the free throw line, or he was missing wide open threes that are a big part of his arsenal, or just, you know, making a bat really awful pass to Fred Van Vliet and his feet when they needed a basket and they needed to settle things down. Like, Lowry's game to me was very imbalanced. It was very up and down. I thought Lowry was good. I thought Lowry was the second best player. Uh, it's, he, he gave you 16, 5, and 7. But I think, mm, well, one, I guess I'm grading on a curve because I think Lowry's hurt. I, 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 he has not looked as explosive uh, since he's come back from the ankle injury. Um, he got bodied and, and looked like he might leave the game on a stretcher and, and stuck around. So I, I think he competed and I think he's hurt. So, so maybe we're looking at his game through different lenses because I was looking at the fact that he was still playing and he was leading and, and making hard. hustle he plays really and hard. diving, getting loose balls and getting in and starting for, um, you know, some fast breaks and and i think also was was willing to to take some shots when when other guys weren't and i guess that goes back to my criticism of of gasol who both of those guys give you a lot of intangible things i just i i he he scored six points and the celtics were daring him to shoot he he is an offensive facilitator but he had one assist like their half court offense was really the issue and part of his biggest value is helping their, their half court offense. So I, I think, I think Lowry was, was, was good to be honest. I, I think the, the bottom line is all of these guys have to be better. Um, and, 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 and well, yes, ex except for OG. Um, and having said that they were still right there. They were still yeah. in the game at, at the, at the end of the game, which is why I'm, I don't want to say I'm not concerned, but I'm not, willing to overreact just yet because i think we see this in the ebbs and flows of playoff series the one big difference is they're in a bubble so there's no change of scenery there's not that that would have helped because of the, the home seed but like the swings of you're going to and from cities that's non-existent um so you know we we shall see but i i, I still expect it to be a long series um I'm in tough with this one because I just think that, like I said, that you, you play those tight ball games. I just anticipate them to all be tight like that. Like the first game, you just can't afford to give one away to a team that's that good as Boston. And that's as hellacious of a matchup for you. But that when you get in tight, you're leaning on Siakam, you're leaning on Fred Van Vliet, you're leaning on Kyle Lowry and you're stacking those three guys up against Jason Tatum, who does who like it reminded me of Kawhi tonight where you look at the box score and say, how, how many points did he have? Because it's all so efficient and it's also effortless and it's not on a, a, a bunch of bad shots or bad looks or bad takes. It's just all of it is crispy. All of it is clean. All of it looks really good. And I don't know how you stop that because he just gets to his spots with such ease. He finishes with, with grace He's just a very poised player for that age, a very poised score. Again, I, I think I was talking to you about this. If, if I could pick – if I needed to pick a score to get me a basket to win me a game right now, my life's on the line, assuming that Kevin Durant is not healthy and in the league, it's Kawhi 
And then it's like probably Jason Tatum. Like it's between those two guys. And I probably only leaning towards Kawhi because I've seen him do it in bigger spots than Tatum. But like, I just think that he's that level of a scorer already in his career. And Kemba Walker, who struggles all night, is just that type of guy who knows that when a big shot is needed and he needs to have a big moment, he's done it a million times before. I know he's not at the NBA level, but that's who he's been since college. And you see how that matters. Like you just, you see how that matters in a late game when he hits that big step back and he just knocks it down. So I am pretty concerned. I don't know if you can fall down to Boston and come back. You're right. There's a lot of positive signs to take out of that game. Again, we will get into OG and Anobi. Um, I think that the Raptors hopefully don't get Gasol into that same foul trouble that he checks that out. Um, but to me, they played three really good quarters of basketball and they still ended up losing to Boston. Like even when you mentioned the first half, like, the Raptors were down and I thought that they played really good. Like I thought that they played pretty, pretty close to their ceiling as a team through the first, you know, the first half of that ball game. It wasn't like I felt like they were leaving a lot on the table and Boston is just right there. And it's kind of scary to think about what would be happening if Gordon Hayward was in this series because yeah, the, these two teams to me, like, there, there does seem to be a gap through two games. Like there, there just does seem to be a, a gap between these two ball clubs because of that top end, top tier echelon talent. Like, that's what it's coming down to for me. Well, Boston has done a great job of taking away what the Raptors are best at, and that's their transition game, getting everyone back. They're not crashing uh, the offensive boards, which makes the fact that, um, you know, Tice is getting so many rebounds even, even that much harder to swallow. But, I mean, it, to me it's pretty, pretty binary. If you are going to shoot 27.5% from three uh, – in a series where you're going up against a good half court defense and you don't have a good half court offense. And it's going to take you 26 minutes of basketball to get to the free throw line. You're just like the math is you're not going to be able to manufacture enough points to win another, uh, a win a game against another good uh, playoff team. And so they had some great stretches defensively, the 11 0 run in, in two minutes and three seconds in the third quarter, as much as it was 11 points, it was them repeatedly getting stop after stop after stop. Yeah. And so there are some good things there, but it's, to me, it's just basically you have to either hit more threes or figure out how to unlock in the, in the half court uh, offense. Cause you're not getting transition offense in this series against this team that is that well coached. And part of the value, they're not the rockets. I said that the she's clear earlier, but part of the value in this Raptors team offensively is like, they don't have a, a Tyler hero or, or, or someone who's just going to you know kill you from, from three necessarily because Matt Thomas isn't in the rotation, but the value is when they take the floor, all five guys can shoot a three comfortably can. Sh and, and, and now that OG has expanded his game, all five guys for the most part can, can shoot a three off the dribble outside of Mark Gasol, who's really a, a set shooter. Uh, like even uh, Serge has added to his game a little bit of like a, a gather dribble and, and, and letting it fire. So there's value in the fact that everyone can provide spacing from all different areas of the floor. But there's no value in that if everyone's bricking their threes. Yeah. And so this is not a great time for, um, you know, the, the guy who, in the bubble was your best three-point shooter and Fred Van Vliet to go cold um, for the entire team really to go cold for Norm to have his minutes be kind of sporadic and him not really getting it going from three. And then the guy who like, you know, it's like cross your fingers. If he makes his threes, they're really scary. And he's really scary in terms of what type of player he could become. He's the only real guy that was making them and, and taking them with confidence. And that was OG, which is why he was the best player on the floor for them. Yeah, and I do want to talk about OG in a second. I do want to talk a little bit about what uh, the, some of the positive signs because I, I did think that there were many. But you mentioned how the Raptors like, don't have that score. They don't have that guy. I thought Norm Powell was going to tip the scales there. Like When you're talking about advantages, you're like, okay, the center matchup. I'm like, okay, I agree. He's supposed to win, be winning the center matchup. Probably not a big enough or sizable enough gap in this series so far. You didn't think that you were going to win the tight ball game score matchup. You knew that was Boston's advantage. They're taking care of that. You knew the defense was going to be very close. It's very close. You thought that the bench was going to be a sizable advantage for Toronto. And Norm Powell, four points tonight. Again, another night over from three. He only takes two threes. 
he didn't look very confident. I thought that the, one of the most notable things of the game, at least of the first half, was that Nick Nurse kept Terrence Davis in with a unit and pulled Norm Powell off the floor before Davis and left Terrence Davis on the floor. And we saw this in last year's playoffs. Not Norm necessarily going cold, even though he didn't really impact that Sixer series, but we've seen that Nick Nurse is... Nick Nurse can be hesitant to trust in at him at times. Like, it's just true. He did it last year in the playoffs a lot. He had a very, very quick trigger for pulling Norm Powell out of games, and he didn't play Norm Powell very much in big moments. And then tonight, where they had a must-win game, and they had some stretches where they just really needed a basket, and they needed someone who could kind of create on his own, when, especially when you know there was no Marcus Gasol on the floor, and there was no Kyle Lowry on the floor, and they were struggling to initiate plays, Norm looks lost. Like, he, out of all of the Raptors players – I would say he looks the farthest from the guy that you anticipated. And this is someone that you and I have talked about being a future six man of the year award winner. And that if he had been healthy this year and didn't start as many games that he might've locked that award up and they're just, they're not getting anything from him right now. And so you got to pitch close to perfect ball games to beat the Celtics teams. And you have to have the advantage with depth. And right now, like I said, Norm just looks rattled. He, he, he does not look like a, his normal confident slashing three-point shooting self that we, we saw in the regular season that was able to win Eastern Conference Player of the Week and who looked like he had legitimately finally broken through to being a reliable scorer off the bench. Yeah, we, I mean, we saw it against the Nets series where he was yeah. brilliant. And there's a reason why the Raptors are looking to become just the second team in NBA history to make it to the finals after losing their leading scorer because that's really difficult and it's tough. And those guys, those types of guys who – take you to the finals as your leading scorer and are the guys who, who have the ball in their hands, making the decisions in crunch time. They don't, they don't fall off trees. And there have been times throughout this season where we've said, this is going to sound weird, but like late in a game to get your own shot, I might give the ball to Norm. Yep. And so I'm not saying you necessarily want a healthy dose of that, but you at least want it as a threat, as an option. And it hasn't been one. Um, been at this point. And I mean, Chris Paul, again, referencing him in his post game, which was a blatant, like not even subliminal, a blatant shot at Russell Westbrook. He said, like some people are built for this and some people aren't. Some people are built for this time of the game and they want the ball and some people aren't. Um, I'm really, I really can't put Norm in either category because we have seen playoff moments where he certainly was built for it. Um, but we're going to need someone, right? Especially if you're not getting the type of production you're going to get from Kyle traditionally because he's banged up or Fred is in a, in a rut. You're going to need someone to overcompensate. And it can't just be OG. He's a starter. It has to be yeah. someone off that bench, when that, and it, whether it's Norm or, or TD or like Chris Boucher gives you an inspired five minutes um so yeah we'll, we'll see what happens uh you know in 48 hours so the positive signs let's start with og you you said to me before the playoffs started that your x factor was og ananobi and i can't remember your entire case but it, it centered around his offense and like if he can show you something from that lakers game and then I, you know, we had talked and we had done some other podcasts and I mentioned how he was not taking shots from inside the arc and he wasn't really getting a lot of burn offensively after that Lakers game. And then like, he wasn't really a, a I would say an offensive factor in that net series tonight. I think he, he just, he proved you right in terms of how much he can elevate this Raptors team. Like it wasn't just the shot making. He's a brilliant cutter. He has been for his entire career. Like that's always been a part of OG Ananobi's arsenal. Like, if you, if you leave him, if you lose attention, he's going to cut behind you to the basket and, and finish around that area. He showed off that spin move yet again that he's clearly been working on where he gets to the basket. And I thought he played pretty extraordinary defense for the most part in that ball game. Um, I, I really, like, I, that kind of sounds obvious where it's like, yeah, if OG Ananobi hits his first four threes and he's chipping in with, what did he finish with, 16, 17? Uh, somewhere around 20. There. He finished with 20. Man, see, again, if OG and here's what I'll tell you. If OG Ananobi's giving you 20 points, who uh, OG Ananobi, surprisingly, is uh, our producer, Michael Mayers, is uh, just like, I'm looking at OG Ananobi right now on our Zoom chat because he's his picture. He's his, his standard profile as his camera's off. If OG's giving you that performance, 
it, it puts you in a, it's like, it's hard to lose that game with OG doing that. Yeah. He, he was great. He had more points than Kemba Walker or Jalen Brown. And these are guys who are um, on the national team for the United States and uh, an all-star in Kemba's case and a borderline one. And, and Jalen, he was really, really good. Crossed the bo- boards hard. I think he had a tough couple of tough whistles go against him, um, but gave them energy, gave them life. And, and was again, a big part of that run uh, for me. The positive is this I, they, they didn't win and and they could have and they should have and there was they left a lot to be desired in a lot of places but the raptors played more good basketball minutes than the celtics did now that means absolutely nothing but going into the fourth uh, they were up eight and this season up until now they were 31 and two going into the fourth quarter with eight point or more lead now they're 31 and three, but the vast majority of times you win that game. Now maybe if Gasol doesn't foul out, um, or maybe they get a couple, a couple of those in and out shots to drop that we're having an entirely different conversation, right? The game was literally that close. So I, I, coming off of game one where you're like, man, where are the answers? And even, I don't know if you heard Nick Nurse's sound in between games, he sounded like, I don't know. Like he didn't really have many answers as to like what he could change and and fix. So again, there's no, there's no like participation ribbons, right? Like you're playing for a championship and you're the defending champs. Um, But I think for the balance of that game, they played better than the Celtics, not well enough to win, not well enough to win a championship, certainly Um, not well enough to beat the Celtics four out of seven times, but they, they, they played well enough, um, you know, to, to give themselves a chance at the end. And, and that's all you want. And, 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 and lastly, and I'll, I'll let you kind of end it, but the, the other positive is not only did they get um, stops defensively, they were creating turnovers, 17 turnovers um, with Boston, who's a team who really takes a good, does a good job of taking care of the ball. Um, and again, a lot of that was effort and hustle and getting into passing lanes and, 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 and playing smart. And, and so um, the defensive intensity from game one to game two was like vastly different. Yeah. I have trouble with silver linings like that just because they lost and now they have to win four or five against the Boston Celtics, a team that they've you know only won one game against this year. So the idea that they're going to do it. I mean, you asked me to say something positive. No, no, no. I, I had to give you something. I'm trying uh, to set Fred up Fred Van Vliet's mind. daughter looked cute. Like, I, what did you want from me? <laughs> hey, you know what? That's accurate. That's not debatable. She absolutely looked cute. The camera cutaway. I really did think like when I'm a fool, but I really did think that them showing up in the bubble, I was like, oh my God, this is going to change everything. You know, I, I'm going to plug good show for tomorrow for a second here because, you know, we have Terrence Ross on tomorrow and uh, he's a great guy to talk to. And he's someone who's mentioned, you know, his family and how much he's been missing his family and how grateful he was to be back with them now that the Orlando magic are out of the bubble. And I I'm curious to hear his thoughts on just like the actual strain and the day to day of that. And I was hoping that, yeah, the Raptors got a lift. They seemingly did get a lift, but I get a little out of my head when I'm thinking, okay, well now Fred Van Vliet's going to hit every single shot. <laughs> like his kids are here. He's going to hit every single shot. Old Fred is back. He was, I thought he was good for moments of that game. I, again, I think that the Raptors were really good in that game. They were doing it the way that we said they had to do it, which is by winning by committee, that everybody was contributing. Everybody had moments where they were doing something solid, so, except for, again, I think Norm Powell, even though you know he did have a couple of baskets, but he really struggled. They were, you're right. They were right there on the doorstep. They're just, they, they, they don't look like teams that are worlds apart. They just look like they have closers that are. And to me, that's what, again, that's the kind of going to be the theme of the series. And that's what we're going to see, but you're right. Maybe Marcus Gasol, no foul trouble. This team is incredibly tough. Uh, you saw when Fred Van Vliet hit that shot, the way he told his team to stay calm. They've been here before uh, against the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, granted they had Kawhi Leonard, but they have still done it as a team. Like they have an example that they can look to from the year before and say, we were in this exact same spot and we came back and we ripped off four straight games. And yes, we had Kawhi, but here's the thing. We're not just a Kawhi team. We can do this. We were right in that ball game. And as you just said it, we were the better team for, I would say the majority of that ball game as well. And Hey, is Marcus smart going to continue to look like Damian Lillard with defense 
Is he going to turn into Steph Curry? Is he going to stay being Steph Curry where you're afraid of Steph and Clay and KD and it's all of a sudden it's Marcus Smart? Probably not. Like there's a lot of things defensively that you can hang your hat on. There's a lot of things that you can hang your hat on in terms of even a guy like Siakam who I thought did unlock it a little bit earlier in that ball game and then lost it as the things got tight. Here's hoping, fingers crossed, it wouldn't be the craziest thing that ever happened. But again, keeps bringing back to four or five. And when you get into crunch time, it's Siakam versus Tatum. Oof, just tough, tough to put yourself in that spot. Um, any closing thought? Anything you want to do? Um, shout out to Jamal Murray. Yeah, uh, are, you, Jamal Murray. are you now a Jamal Murray believer? I tweeted it. Okay. I so you're, you're, you're on, I don't know you're if on board. you muted or not or blocked. I, 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 I try and stay off Twitter as much as possible. It's me too. I, I just try to do the tweet and drop. Yes. Um, so, so you're, you're on board now. You had, you had so, questions when he came out of the draft and early in his year, it's his, his career, but, but now has he, has he done enough to win your love? So and this, this is what I'm saying about Jamal Murray that, and we're again we're taping this like during the game now right like the game has officially tipped off we're gonna go shut this down and go watch it i feel like the takes are gonna be extraordinary if he has one game one way or the other like if he finishes this game seven with a win and he scores you know 35 plus points we're gonna be having conversations about how many scoring titles he's gonna win throughout his career and if he has a lays an egg and he doesn't play very well and they get bounced and he scores sub 30 I honestly think like the expectation for him tonight is to score that. Like they need him to. That's pretty clear. The formula is there that people are going to say, well, that's just classic Jamal Murray. No, to me, his, the hallmark of his career has been inconsistency that I've seen the same moments of Jamal Murray as everybody else, but he's, he struggles defensively and he doesn't put the offensive games together enough for me to believe that he's a true superstar. This moment is incredible. This, this actually feels to me like a legitimate breakthrough for Jamal Murray. Like, he has actually found it. I don't think he's going to shoot 70% for his career like he is in the bubble right now. But do I think differently about Jamal Murray now than I did a week and a half ago? Absolutely, I do. He looks incredible. Like, the, the confidence in which he's playing with, I, I think will last. I really do. And I, I don't know. I just, I look at him and I can see, I can see a guy whose ceiling is now, you know, being one of those top 17 18 players in the nba like I, I just do i see it he he looks phenomenal to me he's absolutely grabbed the torch away from shea gilgis alexander and said i know you guys are excited about shea i'm the best canadian basketball player on the planet right now recognize okay so i think that's a yes right yeah i mean sorry okay. you know i'm long-winded you know i'm never going to get to anything with just a simple yes i don't think that would have made a good point well, i heard like inconsistency in there i was like i don't know so well, it has this been, but he has do? been throughout his career like he's, he's uh, a guy who's yeah, he's, got, he's already got a, a bunch of huge playoff moments. And I think if anything, um, the, my, my biggest takeaway is whether it's Pan Ams and he's on the team as a teenager with pros mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, game seven against Greg Popovich and the Spurs or going head to head with Donovan Mitchell for the last three games. And we'll see what happens is his team's up um, in the second quarter now, um, you know, knock on wood, don't want to jinx him. Uh, um, he has, he has six points. Uh, and two oh. six, so. <laughs> the um, reaction. Yeah. I mean, he's just, his, his, his team has 35. He's the second leading scorer on this team. Well, I mean, he also second, scored second quarter. in game six, he scored, I think it was 33 or 34 in the second half. So like, it's not like he's not capable of just pouring it on later. No, I, I just do. I don't, I don't think that you can replicate that, that skill set. I think that that's very unique to a certain amount of players. And Jamal Murray's one of those guys with that offensive ceiling. And I don't think that this is what we're seeing here is some random happenstance that he doesn't have this ability in him. Like he's clearly an elite scorer and yeah, to put these games together in this way, I, I do think is going to carry over to the rest of his career in the way that we perceive him around the NBA. So yes, I'm on the Jamal Murray bandwagon. Amazing. Now I just have to convince you that DeMar DeRozan is better than Al Horford and we're good. I mean, right now, who would you take? <laughs> I mean, I would have, I would have always taken DeMar DeRozan. So. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah. No, shout out to Jamal for what he did on the floor. Um, but I mean, the, the part of that whole deal that I respected was what he did before and after the game, taking his shoes with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd on them and just like putting them in the media chair and being like, yeah, like, here you go. Shoot this. This is what it's about. Then going on the floor and backing it up and then being um, as eloquent 
but yet vulnerable at the same time in his post game. Um, yeah, I, I rate and respect his um, his moral compass, but his all his mental toughness as well. So, yeah. shout out to Jamal. Yeah, you're making Canada proud. Yeah, I don't know how the hell some of these guys are doing it with the mental toll that they're clearly carrying around. Like you saw that come off his shoulders after the game in his speech. Um, but yeah, it's pretty damn impressive. Uh, hopefully the next time we talk to you, the Raptors have tied up the series and we're talking about miracles here and the Siakam's at a breakthrough and Fred's back to being hot and yeah, Gasol stays in a foul trouble and Kyle Lowry normalizes. Uh, until then, you can share it on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at JD Bunkus at Donovan Bennett. And uh, you can always leave a a beautiful review, subscribe on iTunes, follow on Spotify. Uh, We'll catch you soon. It's free association on sportsnet.ca.